we're going to be in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, uh, like we were uh, last week. And for the sake of time, uh, we're going to go to the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and we're going to start at verse uh, number 10, and we'll read through verse number 13 for the sake of time. And so it says, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. Now abideth faith, hope, charity. These things, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. And we're thankful to the Lord because we understand. We understand that, uh, as we said last week, charity uh, is love in action. Uh, it's benevolence. Uh, it's making sure that you are acting in a way uh, that is for the benefit of someone else. Because many times uh, we are self-seeking and self-serving. And uh, even in this time that we're living in, we, there's so much me ministry, me ministry. Everybody's trying to create their own brands. And instead of understanding that we are better together, I know you, you may get more attention by yourself, but we are better together. And so, of course, Paul wrote because the conflict was Sometimes it feels like you're more spiritual when you're operating in the dimension of the gifts of the Spirit. And, uh, of course, um, my understanding of the gifts of the Spirit is that they're tools for the ministry. And uh, the better tool you have, the easier it is for you to get the job. Uh, I know sometimes we have uh, makeshift tools a butter knife for a screwdriver and a, a shoe for a hammer, the makeshift tools. And those makeshift tools, uh, they serve us while we don't have the real tools. Uh, but the real tools make things easier. And so the gifts of the Spirit are the tools for the ministry that the church uses for the purpose of edification, exhortation, and comfort. That's what Paul says. And so our goal then is to make sure that we are operating from the spirit of charity because we genuinely care about people because you can be gifted and still not care about people. And that's where Paul begins this chapter talking about understanding you do not judge yourself based on your giftedness okay now of course uh, we just passed by uh, Christmas uh, the time that we celebrate for the birth of Christ and uh, there was a whole lot of gifts passed out in some regards and then in other situations there were no gifts passed out. Now, some people gave gifts to people that they didn't even care about. They didn't love them at all. And then other people didn't give anything to people that they claimed they love. <laughs> it's interesting how easy it is. Sometimes we... Uh, we look at giftedness and we say, oh, that means uh, God is especially with that person. Or we look at someone who doesn't have gifts and we say, oh, God is not with that person. 
but it could be equally the same on both sides. You can have a person that is gifted, who is full of love, and then a person who has no gifts, who is not full of love. And so it's really important for us to be able to uh, properly judge and measure and, and realize that though some gifts come with more show, it doesn't mean because you have a show that you have more love. So Paul says, tongues make noise, but if it is not because we're loving, then it's just a noise maker. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. He says, if I don't have charity, if my love is not active, then I am just a noise maker. And, and that's what I was focusing on last week, noise makers. Because it's possible to be a noisy church. You can shout, you can dance, the band can strike up the praise break music. And it can be real noisy and exciting and still not be loving all right and then he says you can have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge so when you talk about prophecy you're talking about from the perspective of edification exhortation or comfort and then there of course is the revelation aspect of word of wisdom and word of knowledge you can have it and still not genuinely care about people, not love them. And uh, I think the problem that we struggle with is because we don't view them as gifts, but rewards. These are God's rewards, so we feel, for our spirituality. But they're not his rewards, they're his tools. And just like uh, if you worked for a company, you would expect them to give you tools. If you join the army, they're going to give you a uniform. They're going to give you a gun. They're going to give you everything it takes for you to go to war. Now, uh, of course, if, if you didn't know better, when you walked in the door and they gave you all of that stuff, you would say, wow, these people really care about me. <laughs> they gave me a whole set of clothes. And they gave me a weapon. But the truth is, they gave you that stuff because they wanted you to work. And God gives gifts so that we can work. Oh man, I just said a whole lot right there. And so he says, listen, you can have the gift of prophecy, edification, exhortation, and comfort. You can understand all mysteries, have word of wisdom or word of knowledge. And you can have all faith have no problem whatsoever trusting God. He says, to the point that you could remove mountains and still not have charity. Wow, that is that is profound to think that if we were to measure ourselves based upon our giftedness, it means nothing if there is no love involved. And so, of course, Paul, Paul then goes on and says, listen, I can feed the poor. I can give my body to be burned and it can still profit nothing. And our challenge with that kind of talk is how how can I be pe feeding the poor? Well, you, I, I said it last week, you can be under obligation by the court system to feed the poor. They can force you to feed the poor as a community service during your probation time. And uh, I'm going to tell you something. I've been in this stuff for 35 years. And sometimes ministry or a pastor re will require those who claim a calling to the ministry to go into some type of service ministry where they are serving others. And guess what? Because they are so hungry for the title of minister and elder and evangelist and missionary and Christian worker, they will do that community service though they don't care about the very people that they're doing it for. So it's possible to feed the poor 
and to give my body to be burned. I remember a few years ago there was a, a, a monk who set himself on fire. He became a spectacle before the people. Set himself on fire, didn't move. Didn't move, man. He set himself on fire. Well, that doesn't mean he loved the people. Just he could have felt like he was going to get better status in uh, in the afterlife. You know, of course, we know what they did on 9-11. They flew into the plane. The pl they flew the plane into the buildings. And they didn't do it because they loved the people. They did it because of they, some expected reward in the act afterlife. Well, it's, it's possible to do some pretty incredible things with the expectation of something that you're going to receive and not actually care about the people that are before you. So, he says, if we did that, it would profit us nothing. It would profit us nothing. That's pretty wild. It would, you mean I wouldn't get any benefit out of it? You mean God wouldn't be glorified? Well, it, it would profit us nothing. So he then begins to break things down and give us some indication of the process of love in action. Because uh, many times it's a great question for us. What is love? How do, how do I know if I have it or not? Uh, how, will people know if I am showing them love? Many times those questions come up. And we're challenged, and we have to answer those. But Paul gives us a good working definition. He says, charity suffereth long. Love in action suffers for a long time. Doesn't quit, doesn't give up, doesn't throw in the towel. Continues in the process as long as it has to. And many times for us, because we're really dealing on a reward system, I do for you, you do for me. If, if I pick you up, you got to pick me up. If I feed you, you got to feed me. We, we deal on a reward system, not on a love system, but on a reward system. Then it's hard for people to know if we genuinely love them. If I am in a jam, if I have a need, if there's no way for me to remunerate what you have done for me, then the question becomes, uh, do you still love me? Do you love me? I, I was having a discussion uh, just about this very subject. Do you, how, how am I going to know? What is it going to take? It is so important. So he says charity or love suffereth long and is kind. It's kind. When, when you understand love, you're striving to be tender, trying to be nice. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get to an ultimate end. And that's a great challenge because we're living in a very abrasive time right now. We're living in a time where <laughs> people will cut you off on the road, flip the bird on you, pull the car right over and challenge you to get out. Uh huh, and which means that you have to have enough love and some sense not to get engaged in that activity with them. And can I tell you something? This is very interesting when I consider it. Uh, many times, uh, people do to other people what they personally cannot bear. They they will cut you off, and then when somebody cuts them off, they'll have a fit. As if somehow or another, what they did was not the same as what was done to them. And so he says, listen, it suffereth long and is kind. And charity envieth not. Now, what does that mean? Charity, when you love people, you don't look at what they have and wish it was yours. You don't wish it was yours. Okay. Because envy is when you look at somebody else's whatever and says, why don't I have that? Man, first of all, you don't know what they went through to get that. You don't know how much it cost them. 
because sometimes it costs them more than you're willing to pay. Now, that's just the bottom line. Sometimes, you know, you go to the store and they have something for sale at the store. And uh, the generic brand is right nearby. And uh, you don't want to pay the price for the name brand. So uh, instead of getting Green Giant uh, string beans, you get Essential. Because Essential is 35 cents less a can. Yeah. Uh, but you want Essential to taste like Green Giant. It's not going to taste like Green Giant. And then you come up with some reasoning in your mind. They're all the same. And uh, it may be true. They may be all the same. But, the, but there's something about that brand that causes them to charge a little bit more. Well, when a person envies, they look at a person in a particular position or status in life, or maybe that person was fortunate to have something uh, that maybe you weren't born with. Maybe you were born short, and you envy all the tall people. And maybe, you know, I mean, people get envious of, of a lot of things, you know. I mean, they get they get envious over silly stuff. I know growing up in New York, you know, a person would go out and buy a new coat and wear it to school, and somebody would get envious of that coat. It was just a little piece of material. It just happened to have somebody's name on it. And the next thing you know, by the end of the day, that person was fighting to keep their coat because somebody envied. Now, I, I don't know what those parents went through to buy that coat. I don't know what that young man, young woman went through to buy that coat. But when you love, you look at what somebody has and you go, I'm happy for you. I'm really happy for you. You know, it's nice. Okay? You, you don't have to give it to test. Sometimes you can see envy in how people give it to test. They, they walk up to you and they feel it. They go, mm, is that real leather? Let me feel that. That look like pleather from here. See, envy has you talking it down because you can't appreciate that they have something. So the first thing you have to do is you have to disparage it. And it's important to be able to realize that we have to be careful about that. A person sings the song nice and the first thing you says, well, you know, you could have done better. You know, well, that's what envy does. When you, when you love a person, you can appreciate what they have done. They did their best. That's all they had. Appreciate what they have done. And then it says, charity vaunted not itself. It doesn't lift itself above others. When you love, you don't have to be the first one on the bus. Okay, you don't have to be the first one in line. You don't have to be the most important person in the room. You don't have to be announced as the leader of the group. It's really interesting that while we claim love many times, uh, we're really to talking about self-love. We love ourselves so much that we want everybody to point their attention upon us. So it doesn't vaunt itself. It doesn't lift itself high. When you love somebody, you don't need a Facebook cameo moment. You know, you go, oh, I'm on Instagram. I'm going to take a picture of myself. You know, sometimes I look at these little feeds and stuff. I'm not, I'm not on all of the social platforms. I'm on one platform. And sometimes I listen to some of these outrageous questions people ask each other in the name of getting attention asking questions that they shouldn't be asking just so they can get attention. What does that say about people? How, how can you love me and you want me to reveal to the world the worst things that I have done in my life? And, and listen, once you put it out there, it's out there. It's not coming back. And you can do what you want. You, you are giving away your privacy, your history, uh, that content will play. Your, your children will see it. Your grandchildren will see it. That stuff will be here for generations to come, and they'll be able to go back and watch your foolishness. Wow, that's pretty deep. So not only do you have an issue with love, <laughs> you don't even love what you're putting out there. 
you're putting that information out there and you don't understand that two generations down the Lord's will, if he spares us and doesn't come for two generations, somebody is going to see you involved in something that's not going to be very flattering. Wow. You know, just just recently, an owner of a football team, and I won't say the name just so I won't get you guys riled up, but they have a star in, you know, in their state. And they found an old photograph of this owner standing in front of people uh, racially resisting a group from going into a school. Now imagine that. Here's a 14-year-old kid, and the social media of the day took the picture, and now this old man has to live down what he did from 14 years old. What am I saying? When, when you love people, then that leaves a great picture behind. All right? People don't have to know your name, but they can know what you do. Okay, they don't have to remember your face, but they can say somebody came by and did thus and so for me. It, it makes me think of that blind man that Jesus encountered. He, he spit in the guy's eye and um, told him to go wash at the pool of Siloam. And uh, when he came up seeing, uh, of course, it was exciting because nobody had, had their eyes open before. But uh, because he didn't see Jesus uh, when the miracle took place, because the miracle, by the time the miracle happened, the man was far from Jesus. You know, but people already had their opinions about him. So they're, they're saying, give God the praise. We know God here, not sinners. And this guy is saying, listen, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I once was blind. But now I see. See, that's what love does for you. They don't have to know your name. They don't have to know where you're coming from. They don't know have to, have to know what state you were born in. But they will remember if you fed them. They will remember if you clothed them. They will remember if you were there as a shoulder to cry on. They will remember if you thought about them when nobody else thought about them. Because love has long-term implications. People remember love. Man, that's pretty deep, man. So love doesn't uh, vaunt itself up. It's not puffed up. It's not puffed up. It's not self-consuming. And that's where our challenge is many times. We are living in a culture that is self-consuming. Always thinking about how they can gain some benefit from what is done. And really, you, can I tell you something? There's some good things you can practice that will help you and help me so that we can be better in loving people. Uh, don't be so quick to take when people offer. Sometimes it's better for you to offer you know, you go out with your friends and you got that one friend that seems like they always say, I'll cover it. You know, and uh, sometimes your, your so-called friends are banking on you to cover it. And um, but it, wouldn't it be nice if at some point that you just said, you know something, I'm going to cover this. I got it this time. Yeah. And they'll go, what? What? You never done that before. Well, you know, you've been so nice to me. And I really care about you. And I want you to know, you know, I'm not taking advantage of you. I, I would do it for you as much as I can. What does that do? That tells them that you are concerned and that you're not there for the free ride. And, uh, you know, you, you're just looking to, to be in good company. So love doesn't puff itself up. It, it doesn't, you know, take a, a picture of the action uh, the good deeds so that others can look on and say you're the best person ever. Then he says in verse 5, does not behave itself unseemly. And see, there's a lot of unseemly things going on in our culture right now. But real love doesn't behave itself unseemly. 
It doesn't want to make a scene. doesn't want to embarrass people. How, how can we love and we embarrass people? Just try to embarrass them so that we will feel good. You know, that now I don't watch them, but I know there are shows that are based on the whole principle of embarrassing people. And these groups of people stand around, uh, cracking jokes on each other, saying humiliating things to each other. And, and I don't know what the name of those shows are, but I know they exist. And when the winner is the one who can uh, say something so bad to shut the other person down. And it seems as if we are in a culture where people don't have a problem with being unseemly. It's interesting. If, if we're talking about love now, charity, love in action, then we really got to learn that my job is to protect. My job is to cover. My job is to be a support. My job is to be a voice. My job is to be an ear. My job is to be a shoulder. That's what I'm here for. What, where did you get that from, Pastor? Ye are the lights of the world. A city set on a hill that cannot be hid. Well, not just light, but salt. Ye are the salt of the earth. I am supposed to add some element to people's lives that impacts it so much that they are seasoned. Now, you know, it's interesting. You can, um, maybe this generation may not understand it quite le quite what I'm talking about, but you can get you a cast iron skillet, a black cast iron skillet, and it, it's a wonderful skillet to use because it retains, it retains the heat when you cook. But before you use such a skillet, there's a process that they call seasoning. And seasoning uh, is a way of making sure that the pan maintains a particular status. It stays oiled. It doesn't rust. I mean, there's certain things that you have to do with a pan like that. You, you just can't throw water in that. Okay, you just can't just leave it sitting around. You got to make sure you maintain the seasoning. And the longer it is seasoned, the better it cooks. What am I saying? The longer we're saved, the better we should be. The more loving we should be. Not the more settled. Mm -mm. The more acts of kindness we should do. The more we should be humbling ourselves. The longer we're saved, okay? Because many times when people think about how long I'm saved, they think about position. If I'm in this position or that position. But, if, you know, David David said, you know, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God. I, I just, Lord, can I just be here? As long as I'm here, that's what I'm interested in. Just let me be in the midst of it. And if I can be in the midst of it, what, whatever that means, if that means I'm feeding somebody, if it means I'm helping to clothe somebody, if it means I'm helping to wash somebody, I'm providing some services, I just want to be there. I want to be in, involved, you know. There are some people, they just, they love the house of God. They love being at church. They love being around the saints. They love helping the people. They love doing something that is of service. And the more they do it, the more they want to do it. Because they, they know that there's something wonderful about loving people and being loved by people and spreading it around. It's something, it feels good when you know that person was hungry and you fed them. It feels good to know that that person had nobody in their life that seemed to care and you took the time to listen to them. Man, that's powerful. And so uh, it's something about love. Love does something powerful. But love doesn't act unseemly. And love does not seek her own. Love is not grabbing for personal attention. And see, and that's what hinders us many times. We're grabbing. We want to sing the song so they can hear that we can hit all the notes, you know, and that we can swing here and swing there and, and go high and go low. And the challenge of that is we're really just trying to get attention 
and love doesn't try to get attention. Man, you know, when I was a kid, it's very interesting. They, they used to, uh, when a child uh, learned how to dance or learned how to sing or learned how to do something that was um, talent-based, they would run into the room, mommy, 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 watch me sing, watch me dance, watch me do this, watch me do that. And, of course, the mother would sit there and watch her child and say, oh, baby, I'm just so proud of you. And that would motivate the child to run out and learn a few more dance moves and, and learn how to sing a little bit better or learn how to draw a little bit more. And listen, I'm, I'm not against affirmations. I'm not against encouraging someone and, and uh, acknowledging and complimenting. I'm not against those things. But love doesn't operate like that. Love is not about me garnering attention, me being the center of the universe. That's not what love is. Love is about me projecting to others what they need, making sure that I am there for those who are in need. And uh, that doesn't mean you're neglecting you. It just means that you're giving your energy towards it. He says, love is not easily provoked. Now, remember, love, uh, the scripture says, suffereth long. Charity suffereth long. Or, well, here's the other side. Charity is not easily provoked. Now, now it's interesting about that because what provokes us? What? Because to provoke literally means, in the Greek, to poke. You know, and uh, I have this little running statement that I say to people, don't poke the bear. You know, why? Because it's a bear. And when you poke the bear, uh, you ought to expect the bear to act a certain way. And uh, But here's the truth about bears. In most encounters, except when they're hungry, they're going to avoid you. Except when you're messing with their cubs, they're going to avoid you. A loud noise will chase a 500-pound bear away in most cases. Now, if he's hungry, uh, that noise is not it's just a dinner bell. <laughs> but <laughs> on the average, uh, a loud noise will chase a bear away. Why? Because he is not looking for confrontation. Okay, he is not looking for that. He's looking for food. He's looking for shelter. He's looking to support the cubs, but he's not looking for confrontation. Well, love is not looking for confrontation. It's not looking for an argument. Love is not even looking to be right for the sake of being right. Because when you love, sometimes you have to suffer wrong so that everything will end up right. Uh, listen, I want to share a little story with you. Many years ago when I first came into the church, uh, I was a part of an auxiliary. And uh, I was made the leader of this auxiliary. And of course, with that, I yielded a certain degree of authority. And uh, there was a person uh, on that auxiliary uh, that wasn't doing right by the auxiliary. Uh, it's just that plain and simple. The person wasn't doing right. And because as the leader of the auxiliary, I took upon the duty and the responsibility to talk to the person to try to get them to do what was right. Well, the person was insulted <laughs> by me telling them they was doing something wrong. And they promptly ignored me. And hence, that began a battle royal between me and that person. And I'm sharing this so, so somebody can understand. Uh, so what, I, what ended up happening was the person continued to ignore me until I looked at the bylaws of the group that I was in. And the bylaws stated, if the person doesn't do thus and so, at a certain point, you can temporarily suspend the person from the group. And I went to the person that was above me and the person that was above that person. And I said, here is my problem. Here is what the bylaws say. Uh, 
what should I do? Can I do this? Because my desire was to regain authority. That's what I was focused on, regaining authority. And uh, the person said, well, you could do that. You could do that. It's within your right to do that. And the person has violated the bylaws of the group. And, you know, how long have you been going through with this person? And it had been about a year at that point. And I said, yeah, it's been about a year. And, uh, and the person is causing a disruption in the group. And I feel it may be to the best interest uh, to give this person a little sabbatical, a three-month sabbatical. And, um, of course, I, I sent the person, gave the person a letter, a formal letter, uh, stating that they would have a three-month sabbatical. And, uh, of course, the person didn't take it too well. They, they began to tell me uh, things about my family has been going to this church for X amount of years. And my, this family member is in this position, and that family is in that position. And, of course, I didn't care at all. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't moved by that. I was like, where I come from, I was like, so, and... And um, so then the person said, well, I, I will appeal to a higher authority. And they appealed to a higher authority, and a meeting was set. When the meeting was set, of course, um, trying to follow through, I, I got on my face, and I fasted, and I prayed in anticipation for the meeting. And uh, the meeting was about four days away. I said, I will fast until the meeting comes. And I will spend some extra time talking to God because I want to do things the right way. And when I got down on my face and prayed and sought God re repeatedly about this question and what had transpired at this point, uh, one day a heavy burden fell on me. And uh, I, I was really disturbed by this burden I felt. It really bothered me, and I, I started to weep, and after a while, the weeping turned into groaning, and oh my goodness, inside I was hurting, and I didn't understand what it was at first, and as I began to worship the Lord, uh, in the midst of that, the Lord revealed to me clearly that this meeting was not going to go the way I thought it was going to go. And not only was it not going to go the way I was thinking it was going to go, that I was going to be the one in trouble. And so I, I cried, and I got up off my knees, and uh, the next day was the meeting. And when I got to the meeting, when I walked into the room, the room was filled with persons to speak on behalf of the person that I was giving a three-month sabbatical. And the meeting for me <laughs> went horribly, <laughs> absolutely horribly. And uh, I walked out of that meeting. I was so hurt and so disgusted. I went home. I fell on my face. And I said, I'm going to pray and ask God why this meeting didn't come out the way it should have. Now, I'm going to tell you why I felt like that because I had followed all of the protocol. I did everything in the way it should have been done. I didn't make a decision of my own. I talked to the person that was over me. I talked to the person that was over that person. I gave the person in question a warning before in writing and verbally. And then eventually I gave the person a letter stating a suspension and for that three months and in that meeting those three months were reversed and wiped off and I was rebuked praise the Lord and uh, I was hurting man so I got on my face and I said Lord I've been fasting these four days seeking your face and you clearly showed me that this meeting was not going to turn out right 
and it didn't turn out right. Now, notice what I'm saying. I thought the meeting should turn out a certain way, and it didn't. And then, of course, uh, as I was on my face talking to God about this, the Lord showed me something profound. And it's something that has impacted my life from that day. He showed me the people that I was winning to him, the souls that had been baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, who came in from all kinds of lifestyles, all kinds of circumstances and situations. And he showed me how patient and long-suffering I was with them. He showed me how much I was willing to bear in the process to try to help them to grow in their relationship with the Lord. In spite of all of the weaknesses and things of that nature that they needed to get rid of so that they could grow in their faith. And then he showed me my position concerning this person. And this is what the Lord spoke to me. He said, you will come past land and sea to go get one sinner. Bring them in here. Be super patient with them. Long suffering with them. And then my, my child that is in here struggling, you ready to chase them back into the world. And of course, I cried because I realized he was right. What happened? I allowed that person to provoke me. And when they provoked me, love was not the motivating factor in the situation any longer. Now I was more interested in reestablishing authority than actually caring whether or not that person walked out to church. Listen, somebody said to me one time, they said, oh, there's liars in the church and there's backbiters in the church and there's crooked preachers in the church and, and there are people who sleep around in the church and, and, and they just went down this long list. And I said to the person, I said, you are absolutely positively right about that. And I said, and I want you to know all of those people are going to get what they deserve. Because as a man soweth, that will he also reap. You don't have to worry. All those people are going to get exactly what they deserve if they don't repent. I said, but, listen, I'd rather be on the ark with all the stinky animals than to be in the water with the dead bodies. Listen, the club is filled with liars club is filled with drug users. The club is filled with alcoholics. The, drug, the club is deal, filled up with people who sleep around, who people who commit adultery, who gossip, who backbite. The club is filled with all of them. And the difference is they're not changing. Praise the Lord. So what am I saying? Before you start pointing your finger at the bride, before you start doing that, Remember, the bride is getting married. Mm -hmm. Before you start saying my uh, living together situation is the same as marriage, you don't have any papers. There's something different about that relationship because it's legal and yours is illegal. So love understands that I'm not going to allow anything to provoke me easily. That means I got to be real patient with people, man. So he says, not easily provoked. Think of no evil. Oh, that's a hard one. Because when you love people, you know, you, you should be trying to think the best. They don't mean any harm. They're not trying to. Maybe you misunderstood them. Maybe they said it in their language. You said, what does that mean? Well, this is what I've come to find out. Uh, New Yorkers talk one way. Uh, DCites talk another way. People from New Orleans talk another way. People from California talk another way. People from Massachusetts talk another way. Everybody talks based on the culture that they come from. And sometimes 
what we're misunderstanding is the culture. And sometimes the words don't mean the same thing. And we've got to be careful about that. So, charity, think of no evil. Rejoice of not in iniquity. When we see that somebody has a problem, we shouldn't be excited about that. We should not be excited. We should actually be very sad that this person has this weakness. And, you know, I tell the story of a friend of mine many years ago. His name was Jerome. And Jerome was a crackhead. No and, no ifs about it. He was a crackhead. But he was a functioning crackhead. And what does that mean? That means he got up and he went to work. He did his job very well. And he did not allow his drug addiction to stop him from managing regular life. So every time he got close to payday, Jerome would come to me. And he would say to me, he said, look, man, you know I'm a crackhead. So you got to know I'm a crackhead. Uh, yes, yes, Jerome, I know you're a crackhead. And he said, now, now I'm a crackhead, but I don't want to live on the streets. I'm a crackhead, but I don't want to rob people. I'm a crackhead. You know, I don't want to be breaking into stores and all that kind of stuff. I said, yeah. So he said to me, listen, I'm going to give you my money. And I want you to take my money and put it away. Do not give it to me. Because I want to be able to pay my bills once we get through the weekend. And he did this every time he got paid. And he said, now, of course, uh, the little piece of money that I'm going to keep, you know what I'm going to do with it, right? I said, yeah, you're going to go get some crack. He said, yep, I'm going to get some crack. I said, oh, okay. I said, well, I said, you don't have to worry. I'm not going to give you the other money back. He said, but I'm going to come back for it. You know I am, right? I said, yeah, I know you're going to come back. He said, you know, I'm going to threaten you, right? I said, I know you're going to threaten me. He said, yeah, I'm going to call you all kinds of things. Yeah, I, I know you're going to call me all kinds of things. <laughs> and sure enough, he got paid on Thursday. That's when our payday was. It was on Thursday. And I would go with him to cash his check. And he would give me the money. And then he would say, all right, see you. We would part when we cash the money, cash the check. We would part. And by uh, Thursday evening, he would be calling me. Hey, man, I need that money. I'm like, I can't, I can't give you that money. And then he, he, would, he would get angry. Oh, you're going to give me my money. That's my money. You can't tell me what to do with my money. And I said, no, I can't tell you what to do with your money because you gave me the right. And then he would get even more desperate and start cussing. You frigger, fragger, frigger, fragger, friggity, friggity, fragger. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Lord. And I said, you can call me whatever you want. I said, cuss me out all you want because I care about you. Yeah. I'm going to let you cuss me out. That's why I'm letting you cuss me out. Go ahead, cuss me out. Cuss me some more. <laughs> then he start threatening. I'm coming to get you. I'm coming by your house. You're going to give me mines. I'm bringing the police. I said, you can't bring the police. You're a crackhead. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to tell you why I did it. Because I did not rejoice in him being a crackhead. I didn't rejoice in what he was doing in his life. I was trying to spare him from going either even further down. And many times we will see and know a person's weakness, their iniquity. And instead of striving to bear their iniquity, we will fall to a place where we're almost acting just like them. Listen. Charity rejoiceth not in iniquity, wrong things. But it rejoiceth in the truth. Well, what is the truth? The truth is that I love you. And you're messed up. And you got a bad attitude. And you're short with people. And you lie. And you fail because you want to fail. Yes, yes, I know that stuff. 
but I still love you. I know that God can help you, and I'm trusting that he's going to break those cycles in your life. It rejoices in the truth. Then in verse 7, it bears all things. Listen, when you love somebody, you put up with stuff, man. You put up with stuff. You put up with nonsense. You put up with them running you down and talking about you. You put up with them not supporting you. Not being willing to take from you, but not give to you. Man, ooh, that's, a, that's a rough one, man. That's a rough one. But you bear it. Why? Because you love them. And you know they're not going to treat you right. You know there's some people, friends and family, that this holiday, listen, I wasn't even expecting nothing. Because they never give nothing. I wasn't even expecting nothing. I was like, well, I know I'm not going to get something from Bubba. Because Bubba is never giving anybody. Bubba comes like this with the hand out. But they never give anything. And you know something? I think it might be the rapture when they give something. <laughs> so, <laughs> it bears all things. It believes one day, one day, I believe you're going to change. I believe you're going to get free. I believe you're going to walk in victory. I believe you're going to allow God to use you. I believe your situation is going to change. When you love, you always have an expectation that things will get better. When I first got saved, I had this little custom. It was my custom. And uh, people kind of, kind of knew me by it. Uh, when I was going through... I made up my mind I was going to sing, I won't complain. You know, other people were singing, I'm running for my life, and, you know, and all these other great songs in church. Well, I was kind of known for, <laughs> I won't complain. <laughs> I won't complain. So I'd stand up in church, you know, all of my good days, I weigh my bad days, I won't complain. And people, they just kind of look forward to me singing, I won't complain. And, uh, but what they didn't understand was the reason why I sang the same song over and over is because I told the Lord, I'm going to sing that song instead of complaining. Because the truth is, I had plenty of things to complain about. You know, when you got situations in your life, your money's not right, you want to complain about it. When your relationships are not right, you want to complain about it. When the dog goes meow and the cat goes woo-woo, you want to complain. <laughs> you just want to complain. But I made up my mind. I said, you know something? I'm going to sing this song and sing this song and sing this song. And after a while, people was like, that's your song. <laughs> and it became a testimony to me, to God, that I refuse to engage in that activity. Charity believeth all things, hopeth, E-T-H, all things. Oh, it's going to, I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know when the change is going to take place. I don't know when God's going to do it. Somewhere down the line, something's going to happen. Something's going to be manifested. God's going to move in some way. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I just I have an expectation because that's what hope means. Hope means a future expectation. So love, hope of all things, endureth all things, is willing to go through the process. I'm reminded, you know, a friend of mine, <laughs> he's a pastor now, a very good friend of mine. We... We used to have these contests, these um, exercise weight loss contests. And um, I used to always talk stuff to him. I'm going to destroy you. <laughs> and he would call me up and say, I'm going to destroy you. And then hang up, click. <laughs> and, uh, of course, we went back and forth, back and forth. And, oh, my goodness, every day, you know, I would be out there running the street. You know, running to the gym, running down the road, building up endurance so at the end I could have bragging rights. Because that's what we were doing it for, bragging rights. I was building endurance to win. Would you imagine if we just took that attitude in church? I'm going to build endurance 
for the person who doesn't have the victory yet. The person who still has a bad attitude, but I'm not going to allow their bad, atti bad attitude to cause me to have a bad attitude. I'm going to be able to love them. Let me tell you something, and I'm a, this is just for the brothers. Uh, many times uh, when you first get married, you got to have endurance, you know, because because many times your wife don't know how to cook yet. So you have to endure all those bad, <laughs> all those bad meals <laughs> without saying this food stinks. <laughs> And you know something? Many times you don't know how to clean up the house. And she's got to endure you have cleaning the house. Because you guys know there's a man clean and then there's a woman clean. <laughs> so you got to have endurance in this process. So he says, charity never faileth. When you love, there is no quit in love. There is no quit in love. Praise the Lord. There is no quit in love. You don't stop loving people. Praise the Lord. You don't stop loving them. You always continue to love. Now, sometimes love demands that you change how you interact with them. Because when they're doing things that are hurtful to you, you do not have to allow them to abuse you. Ooh, that's a pretty deep one right there. You don't have to allow people to abuse you, but you can still love them. Praise the Lord. So charity, love and action never fails. But then he says some powerful things. Okay, because it's really vital to know whether there be prophecies. And we are living in a time where everybody's a prophet now. Prophet John, Prophet Willie, <laughs> Prophet Bob, Prophet Bozo, Prophet everybody. And listen, I believe in the prophetic, so don't get me wrong. It's not that I don't believe in the prophetic, but uh, let's make sure if we're, we're claiming to be prophetic, that at the same time, we're not pathetic. We know how we're supposed to interact with each other. So whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Now, that's interesting because Paul, of course, in the 13, 14th chapter of this same book, gives us guidelines by which we judge prophecies. And of course, according to the Old Testament standard, a prophet had to be dead on. But here, Paul says, uh, there can be prophecies that do fail. Wow, that's pretty deep. And he says, and whether there be tongues, they shall cease. And of course, we are living. When I Listen, when I first came into the church and you heard a gospel song, you never heard anybody speak with tongues. Never. Because we certainly believed that all that tongue talking was out of order. Well, what made it out of order? Because he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, pray also that he may interpret. So the goal was not to have a, a CD filled up with a bunch of tongues, but that's changed now. So now almost every song starts with tongues. <laughs> no interpretation, just tongues violating the order of scripture. But whether there be tongues, they shall cease. There is going to come a time when tongues will not function anymore. It's not now, but it's going to come where there will be no need for tongues. You say, well, why? why? Why would there be no need? Because when we come to that time when the Lord comes, the initial evidence of tongues won't be necessary anymore. It will not be necessary. He says, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So you get a word of knowledge. That's, that's powerful. But that's only for the now. There's going to come a day where word of knowledge will be of no value to anybody. Now, it's important that we begin to catch a hold of this because we're still talking about love. And Paul cycles back and forth between gifts and love, the value of gifts and the value of love. You put a high premium on gifts, but you put a low premium on love. You put a high premium on manifestation of tongues and interpretation of tongues and prophecy and word of wisdom and word of knowledge and working of miracles and the gifts of faith and the gifts of healing. But then you put a low premium on the manifestation of love. Wow. Man, that's pretty deep. 
We've got to make sure that we keep it in the right order. Because he says, listen, whether there shall be tongues, they shall cease. And whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. That's important to understand. The things that we hold as so valuable are only functional. Let me say that again. The things that we hold as so valuable are only function, functional. Now, what does that mean? Let me give you an example. You are in your backyard and you are trying to dig up the ground. Well, you could use a spoon, but it's not functional. You will be there all day with a spoon trying to get down into the ground. But if you had a shovel, the shovel is functional. It serves the purpose because it works wonderfully with the dirt. But if you took that same shovel into the kitchen, cooked yourself a plate of food, and then tried to use that shovel in the kitchen, it's not functional again. Gifts are functional. They serve a function, and that's it. But love, well, love can cause me to dig that hole even with a spoon. Wow. Love, oh my goodness, love can function in places where it seems unfunctional. Man, that's pretty deep. When you're hated, when you're despised, when you're dishonored and disrespected, love can function in those places. Now, you could take a shovel and hit them upside the head with it, <laughs> but that's not going to be love. Love is not just functional. It serves great purpose in the life of the believer. So he gives us some great things, man, concerning love, man. We've got to understand that these tongues are going to cease. These prophecies are going to cease. These, these, this knowledge is going to cease. He says, we know in part. Listen, I don't care how skillful you are. I don't care how accurate you are. I don't care how gifted you are. You only know a part. You know, and you know, the Lord set it up that way so we will be interdependent upon each other. That's why he made it so. So even if you see somebody that has what is considered a more honorable part, and that's according to 1 Corinthians 12, because some parts are more honorable and others are less honorable. Okay? Some parts are more honorable. That, that's just the way God, God stacks some parts. But at the same time, they still need other parts to be functional. So he goes through this process because he wants us to understand this. We know in part. We don't know all of it. We know in part. He says we prophesy in part. So when a person gives you a prophetic word, they are not prophesying your whole life. They are only prophesying concerning a particular element of your life. You know, it's interesting when the Lord revealed to me that I was to start this ministry. He only gave me a part of it. If he, listen, I'm going to tell you something. If he had told me all the nonsense that I was going to go through after starting this ministry, I would have ran like Jonah and got on a cruise. I just would have done it. I would have got right on a cruise and somebody would have had to throw me out into the water and I would have had to have been swallowed by a fish. And the fish would have had to keep me down there for three days. And I would have to feel like I was in hell before I went to do this. Why? Because God only showed me a part. He said, well, I don't, I don't understand that concept. Well, you know, God normally shows us the part that's going to excite us. Let me give you an example. He showed Joseph a part. He gave him a wonderful dream. In the dream, he saw the sun and the moon and the stars bow down to him. And when he started telling the dream, oh, my goodness, it was interesting. His father knew right off the bat what was happening. He said, what? Shall I and your mother and your brethren bow down to you? Wow. See, now, listen, I'm going to tell you something. This is a little sibling rivalry. If you have any siblings, you know about this. Simply, the, the youngest ones want to be the oldest ones. 
And the oldest ones want to be the youngest ones. Praise the Lord. And sometimes the middle ones are the most troubled. Because they're like, yeah, you may be the oldest, but I am the matriarch or the patriarch of the family. So here's what happens. God is the one that gave Joseph the dream. But that dream got him in trouble. That dream made his brother so mad, they took him and threw him in a pit. Yeah, that's what happened. You say, I, well, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Listen, when, when Jesse came by to anoint, uh, you know, I mean, when Jesse was at the house and Samuel came by to anoint the, the king that was to replace Saul, they didn't even bring David to the house. They left David out in the field. And the prophet said, oh, is, is there another son here? Now, this is after he already looked over the brethren. Is there another son? See, when we receive prophetic word, oh, we all oh, glory. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm getting married. I'm having three kids. I'm traveling the world. I'm doing ministry. Oh, God's going to bless me coming and go. Yeah, it sounds wonderful. <laughs> but that's only in part. <laughs> that's only in part. So you, but you're going to have to love through all of that. You're going to have to love through every bit of that. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Because we can get so caught up. You know, you got people, they take the prophecy, they write it down, they reinterpret it, they, they speak it every day. I'm going to declare, decree and declare this. This is going to, thus saith the Lord, it shall come. To, I will be the head and not the tail. I will be above and not beneath. I will, okay, keep on announcing all of that stuff. Because guess what? In the midst of that, you're still going to have to love. And after Samuel came and anointed David, when David showed up at the battlefield, the brothers were angry with him and said, what are you doing here, you show off? Wow. And guess what David had to do? He had to love him. He had to love his brothers in spite of him. And when God used David to kill Goliath, oh, what a wonderful deal. But when the people started singing, Saul have his thousand and David have his 10,000, David has got to love Saul enough that he says, even though this man is trying to kill me, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. Man, that's love. That's love, man. That's love. It's really important that we understand love because we, we know in part. We only get a little piece of it. I'm telling you, when the Lord spoke to me 35 years ago, I didn't know what was in store. I, uh, I just knew I was just going to be riding on the love boat, <laughs> making another run. I just knew these things. Some things God said to me, I said, whoo, how, glory to God, I'm going to have such and such and do such and such and go such and such and produce such and such. And guess what? God did just what he said. The Lord did just what he said. But my attitude about it changed. Because circumstances and situations force me to have to make hard cho choices concerning love. Wow. So we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When Jesus comes, that's when it's going to happen. When Jesus comes, all of this partial stuff is no longer going to be necessary. So he's not, look, when the Lord himself descends, he's not going to be looking for tongues. He is not going to be looking for prophecies. He's not going to be looking for word of knowledge. When the Lord himself descends, he's not going to be looking for those things. What is he going to be looking for? Love. He said, he that saith he loved God and hateth his brother is not rooted in love. And he said, and no person who is a hater, a murderer, have eternal life reigning in them. Ooh, that's pretty deep. 
So you mean after I talk in tongues, I can still miss it? You mean after I get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, I could still miss it? You mean after I prophesy, I could still miss it? You mean after I operate in word of wisdom, word of knowledge, the gifts of healing, faith, miracles, discerning of spirits, you mean I could still miss it? Yes, I can still miss it because it requires love man so when i was a child oh my goodness see when i was a child it, things were so much simpler there was no expectation all i did was eat sleep and poop that was it <laughs> that's a child for you okay get up play with your toys leave a mess walk away from your mess wait to be fed get in the bed get up the next day repeat when I was a child, there was no responsibility on my life when I was a child. You know, there's a term that they use now, say, adulting. Adulting. And, and here's the truth. Years ago, they didn't use those kind of terms. Okay? You say, why? Because they taught you things that led you right into adulthood. It wasn't culture shock for you. <laughs> you already knew you had tasks and duties and responsibilities in the family that you had to cover and you covered them every day and there was an expectation from you and by the time you stepped out of your door to begin your journey as an adult outside of the door there were so many things that you had already done so it wasn't new well guess what when I was a spiritual child, I didn't know what, what was expected of me. So I didn't pray like I should have. I expected others to pray when I was a spiritual child. When I was a spiritual child, I didn't know the importance of fasting. So other people fasted on behalf of me. When I was a spiritual child, I didn't know the word of God for myself. So just like a Gerber baby, somebody fed me. Mm -hmm. I was a spiritual child. When I was a spiritual child, somebody else fought my battles. I didn't fight them. They fought for me. But there always comes a time you've got to grow up. And I keep saying this to our church. We have to mature. We can't stay children. We can't stay in the same place. We can't lead people like babies. Mm -mm, no, if you can't endure hardness as a good soldier, how and why would you expect them to be able to do it? If you're not patient, if you're not kind, if you're not long suffering, if you're not full of mercy, why would you expect them to be? Many times we project on the people the struggle that we have within ourselves. So he says, listen. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. Because children think immaturely. But when I became an adult, when I grew up, see, growing up is not about just staying out all night. Because when you're a child, you're like, oh, man, I got to come in at 7, 30, 8 o'clock. I can't wait till I get grown. For what? So you can stay out? Is that what you think being grown is? Grown is carrying the load. Grown is keeping a head over your uh, a roof over your head and clothes on your back and food in your stomach and supporting life. Grown. When you're in the church, you're not just sitting there sopping up all the stuff. Now you're bringing somebody else so that they can sop it up. And you're helping to contribute to their spiritual growth. Now you're the person saying to the new convert, hey, you need a prayer partner? See, if you love, you understand that's what it comes down to. One thing about a baby, the baby is sufficient. It can only function if someone takes care of the baby. That's how babies function. You leave a baby alone, the baby's going to die. And sometimes I think we're missing that because we don't mind leaving babies alone. And then we say things like, 
If they love God like me, really? Is that love? To abandon the baby? Is that love? Wow, it's pretty deep. He said, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. I stopped with childish things. When you take toys and put them in front of a child, a child wants all of them. That's childish. When it comes time to take care of the duties and chores in the house, a child tries to go outside. A child keeps playing games. And some of us, we run away when confronted with the chores. Ooh, I'm talking good. He says, but now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Right now we only see in a cloudy vision. But then it's going to be so clear, you're going to be able to see the details of the face. You know, when you when you go to the door and you got the little peephole, man, the peephole don't give you a full view. <laughs> Everybody's face looks kind of distorted. And you're looking with one eye out there. You kind of looking, yeah, I think that's because you're only seeing darkly. But when you can see clearly, see, when you become mature, you see clearly what needs to be done. Man. He said, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. He says, now abide a faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Why? You figure faith, faith, if I had faith to move mountains, wouldn't that be greater than love? No, because you only need faith because you can't see. That's all. That's why you need faith. Because you can't see. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11 and 1. Well, hope, well, hope is the anchor of the soul, right? Wouldn't hope be it? No, hope is a future expectation and anticipation of what is to come in the future. When the Lord comes, the future will be right before you. You will no longer have to wonder what heaven looks like. You won't have to wonder about a glorified body. You won't have to wonder about how life is going to go because it's going to be right before you. It will no longer be a future expectation, but it will be a present time experience. Wow. But love, wow. You can love in the past. You can love in the present. You can love in the future. You won't need to prophesy in heaven. You won't need miracles in heaven. You won't need tongues in heaven. You won't need a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge in heaven. Because all knowledge will be available to you when you get there. And all languages will be available to you when you get there. All understanding will be there when you get there. But the one element that will carry from this life to that life will be love. We will love him, he will love us, and we will love each other. Wow, man, that's some pretty deep stuff, man. That's some pretty deep stuff. Everybody, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait till I get to heaven. It's going to be perfect. But what's going to make it perfect? Because love is going to be there. And there'll be no hate. There'll be no murder. There'll be no starvation. There'll be no rape. There'll be no anger. There'll be no envy. There'll be no strife. There'll be no unforgiveness. All things will pass away. And behold, all things are become new. Wow. That's pretty deep. First Thessalonians 4 and 9 says, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Man, you mean God can teach you that? Yes. He can take those bitter things out of your heart. He can transform your mind. He can bring you to a place of understanding so that you learn how 
to be there for people. Because that's what love does. Love causes us to be there one for another. Wow. Man. Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. And if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. You mean I can have all nine gifts of the Spirit and not be perfect? Oh, of course you can. Of course you can. But you can have love and be perfect. Because perfect love. Cast out fear. Love covereth a multitude of sin. Oh, I could go down the list when it comes to love. Love is always going to put you in a place where we are standing in the gap. Praise the Lord. This is what the Bible says in 1 Timothy 1, 5, and 6. Now the end of the commandment is charity. Well, you, there's 613 commandments in total. They're capsulized in 10. But the end of all 613 is love, charity, love in action. Now, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfainted. He says, from which some have swerved, having turned aside unto vain jangling. You know something? You can talk yourself out of love. You can talk yourself out of it. You can talk yourself right into hell. Because God revealed his love. 1 John 3, 16 through 18. Hereby perceive we the love of God. Because he laid down his life for us. The picture of the perfect example of love. Self-sacrificing. Love is going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something. You can't love without a cost. You can't love without cost. It's going to cost you something. And some of us want love, but we want it free. It's going to cost us something to love. You're going to lose something in the process. And when you love, you don't mind losing. You know, it's when you have children and you love your children. And you only got enough food for you or your children. And your stomach is going, mm. And your children, they don't have to work, you do. And you have to maintain your strength so that you can keep everything going. And because you love them, oh, I'm hungry, but I got to take care of you. I'm tired, but I got to take care of you. We don't have enough resources, but whatever it takes, I got to take care of you. That's how love works. That's how love works. He laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down ours for the brethren. He says, but whosoever have this world's goods, and see if his brother have need, and shut up, up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? See, love is not just what you say. It's what you do. It's not just what you say. Listen, I'm going to close, but I'm going to tell you something. Some years ago, the Lord gave me that song, Christians by Our Love. And I was standing in a bank on K Street. And those words came ringing in my spirit. I, I, I was startled because I was there in that bank on behalf of the company I was working for. I was taking care of some business. I was standing in line waiting for my chance to see the teller so I could take care of that very important business. And these words rang in my mind. How will they ever know 
if believers never show commanded by his word to see and not just her it's our responsibility to walk in victory we are Christians by our love and I was like oof I hurried up and got rid finished with the business came outside of the bank and the Lord gave me the whole song while I was standing right in front of that bank. And I started crying. I said, oh, this is a great responsibility. This is a great responsibility. I said, wow, just like those words, hold on my brother, hold on my sister. It's our responsibility to walk in victory. There's no way over. There's no way under. We are Christians by our love. Yeah, that's pretty deep to think. Listen, if you're watching this stream tonight, there's a great challenge and mandate on our lives. And that is the challenge of charity. That's the challenge, charity. The scripture says charity is the bond of perfectness. Who? it's pretty deep. It's my responsibility to tell you if you're not saved, you need to be saved. Listen, I'm not trying to send you to eternity not prepared. I don't have heaven or hell to send you to. I could just tell you the truth. And if I love you, I want to tell you the truth. I really want to tell you the truth. And so the Bible says, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Listen, that's not my dogma. That's not my denominational persuasion. That's the scriptures. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Not not a Baptist, not a Methodist, not an Episcopalian, not a Catholic, not a Pentecostal, not an Apostolic, but every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Guess what? Talking about charity tonight, it's so important that we love. Listen, let me challenge you on the other side. If you love this ministry, because I'm telling you, people tell me, oh, I love the church. Oh, I love your preaching, Pastor. I love your teaching. Well, if you love it, then you'll support it. If you love it, if you love it and you're a member, you'll pay your tithe. If you love it, if you love it, then you'll support it with your offerings and your special gifts. If you love it, mm -hmm, if you love it, that's something. Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So there are multiple ways to give. You can give through our cash app, which is dollar sign infam, I-N-T-L. Dollar sign infam, I-N-T-L. Or you can go to our website, which is infamily.org. And you can give as unto the Lord. We're so thankful for those of you who love New Foundation, Apostolic Ministries International. Of course, this is the last Bible study of 2022. And we wanted to end it with love. <laughs>